Sally Cunningham is the strategic HR executive in the business development function at GE Corporate. In her time at GE, she has led a $21 billion sale of GE's healthcare biopharma business. She's created a GE healthcare M&A role in 2013, and she's helped thousands of employees become more engaged and resilient in times of change. Sally is nationally sought after for her expertise in mergers and acquisitions, as well as the development of executive managers into leaders. She's a graduate of Culver Stockton College in 1995 with a bachelor's in English. She was also involved with Alpha Z Delta and the choir, for those of you that are in choir. She received her master's in HR management from Webster University. She's a food enthusiast, so make sure you talk to her about food, and she loves long distance cycling. And uh, uh, I found this very interesting. As well as being a board member from Fort Culver Stockton College, she's also a board member of a brewery in Wisconsin. So uh, you can talk to her about beer if you want, I guess. The Dean of Students is giving you permission to do that, but she would love to have that conversation with you. So please give a warm welcome to Sally Cunningham. So much for having me. It's it's really a thrill to be here today. So, most of you in this room today were between six and ten years old in 2008, when the financial crisis had hit hard here in the U.S. And this may be when you witnessed one or both of your parents lose a job, just like I witnessed my own parents weather the farm crisis of the mid 1980s at a similar age. And for many of your parents. The person who delivered the news that they would not have a job to return to tomorrow was someone like me. I've spent 25 years working in HR, starting the Monday after I graduated from Culver Stockton College in May of 1995. I've had a, a pretty amazing journey where I've learned and done things that I truly never imagined, never even crossed my mind when I was growing up and, and going to school here. And some of the most important lessons that I've learned and, and times that I've witnessed the best leaders emerging have been during the most trying and troubling, troubling times for a business, yet they somehow managed to engage and mobilize the workforce through it and emerge stronger than ever. My first couple jobs out of college were complete disasters, so just prepare yourself now for that. <laughs> The places that I worked at the time were not the sophisticated organizations that they appeared to be on the outside. And, you know, I, I knew that I wasn't going to have the career growth at these places that I imagined for myself, but the rent was due, and I needed to figure out how I was going to squeeze enough experience out of these situations to launch me into my next job. And as miserable as I may have been sometimes, I knew it would be worse for me to be unemployed and looking for a job. So I finally landed a recruiter role at a hospital. And at the time, I wanted nothing more than to be a professional recruiter. So this was super exciting for me. And where I was working at the time was Boone Hospital Center in Columbia, Missouri. And that hospital, I, I'm sure it still is, it, it was then, it was remarkably ahead of its time. Everyone talked about the war for talent in the late 1990s, but Columbia, Missouri really did have the lowest unemployment rate in the nation, which was at less than 1% at the time. And we had to differentiate ourselves in a city of 80,000 people with six hospitals. So imagine the war for talent in a city of that size with all uh, of those hospitals and so few clinical talent competing for those roles. So just prior to starting there, the hospital had sent a group of leaders to Disney to learn about the Disney approach to many different things, including some things related to HR. And the whole concept behind this was that um, by creating a community and a culture around the workforce, this engagement of the employees would then enable the employees to create the best experiences for customers or patients in our case. 
And this meant putting employees first, including uh, all the people from the front lines in identifying and implementing quality improvements, communicating right up front what basic expectations were going to be for employees and the core competencies that were going to be required for jobs. The idea of creating an employer brand was really innovative at the time. And the CEO that we had was visionary, and he had a team of great senior leaders. And he empowered them to do the right thing and work across their respective functions, giving each of them a voice and a seat at the table. We got to do so many innovative things at this hospital. When I talk about the war for talent, you know, it wasn't just the jobs that we had available at the time, it was the war for talent for jobs that we were going to have in the future. And we knew that demand was going to continue to rise in certain areas. And we had to be creative as an HR function to think about how we were going to reach out in our community and encourage people to choose Boone. And if you're familiar with Boone Hospital, that, sh that should sound pretty familiar to you. And so this whole thing about choosing Boone was, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was interesting because, like I said, we had six hospitals in the area, or just in the, in the city limits, really, and um, we would see these patterns where one hospital would offer, you know, a $1,000 signing bonus, $1,500, $2,000, and we'd watch nurses kind of make their way. We could see on their job applications, like, oh, they went over to the University of Missouri when they had their $2,000 bonus. Oh, they went to Ellis Fischel when they had their $1,000 bonus. And, and, and you'd watch this rotation going around town. And we didn't want to be that employer. We knew that if someone was willing to leave Boone Hospital for 1000 bucks, they didn't want to be there. And so we had to make it a compelling environment and create reasons why people wanted to come to work there. And there was so much that we did to build that culture around treating people with dignity and respect, engaging people at all levels in all jobs, like I said earlier, to make quality improvements and make suggestions. Everybody was a part of the process. So it was, it was such a great thing to witness. And you know, even though at the time I couldn't articulate it the way I can today, this is when I really first understood the value of an engaged workforce that idea that a workforce could truly be transformational for a business. So you can probably tell I loved that job at the hospital. I was recruiting for a lot of really interesting roles and I was hiring the best people who wanted to be there. And it's easy to work in healthcare. People have tremendous passion for what they do and they come to work with a sense of purpose and pride. But I also, you know, at the same time, I was learning a lot, but I was outgrowing the role. And as engaged as I was in the mission of the business and the exciting things that we were doing, at one point I had a manager who treated me terribly. And uh, on a personal level, I was disengaging. And as much as I tried to kind of work around this manager, ignore this manager, solve problems with this manager, the bad started to outgrade, out, outweigh the good, and I needed to get myself out of the situation. So fortunately, my husband had an opportunity with his job to move to Madison, Wisconsin. And so for you know, the last almost 20 years now, we've, we've lived in Madison, and, and we've absolutely loved, loved being a part of the Madison community. And we had wanted to move. We didn't know where we wanted to go, but Somebody made us an offer and was willing to pay for our relocation, so off we went. And it gave me a way to gracefully exit from the hospital, which I really wanted to be able to do. And with relative ease, I found another recruiter role in Madison, and this time it was with a Fortune 500 telecommunications company. I was so thrilled to be in my first truly corporate environment there. My director was well respected and had that coveted seat at the table that you always hear about. And uh, I performed well, and I made it known to my manager that I wanted to move my career in the direction of an HR business partner role, and that soon happened. And this business was so great to me. I, uh, they really invested in my education. They sent me to classes through Cornell University for creating succession planning and talent management programs. 
The director of HR uh, in the company gave me really important and timely feedback when I wasn't on top of my game and when I wasn't as prepared as I should have been. And I was, once again, very engaged. My professional needs were being met and I was growing. And I was super productive. You wouldn't believe the amount of work that I can churn out. I wanted to do well, and I, want, and I just I worked countless hours to create and launch those talent management and succession planning programs. I was part of a core team that partnered with consultants when we completely revamped our compensation <coughs> philosophy and system. And that's learning that I've carried with me and, and work that I've continued to do in jobs since that time. And I worked more closely with the executive team in this company, the officers of a Fortune 500 company, which allowed me to hone my own executive presence in new ways. And here's where I saw again the value of an engaged workforce. There are numerous studies that support the idea that an engaged workforce is a productive workforce. These programs that we were developing were not only engaging for me as the project leader, but they were creating opportunities within the organization for our top talent to rotate into different roles, take risks and work on new projects, and essentially work across different types of challenges, which you want any of your top talent to be able to do. And the telecommunications industry at the time was going through a lot of consolidation and change, and we needed an emerging crop of business leaders ready to launch the business into this new paradigm. And as great as things were going, I also managed the process of reducing a workforce for the first time in my career. I still remember poring over that list of employees that we selected for the layoff. It wasn't a big list, only a few people, but these were people who lived paycheck to paycheck and their livelihoods were going to be impacted severely, and I did not take that lightly. When planning a layoff, we often refer to the list. Who's going to make the list? Will performance or seniority be the primary drivers of who makes the list? Maybe it'll be a special skill set that's needed for the future work team that drives the selection process. Are we being objective enough or are we allowing our personal biases to drive subjective decisions? We talk through the risk of lawsuits, especially where class action opportunity might exist. We'd also discuss the safety of our employees. Should we have security on site the day and days following an action? How will we observe how our impacted employees are reacting? And how are we going to communicate the action to the remaining employees? I, I can no longer recall the specifics of the individual no notification meetings from that first time, but the VP and I who hosted the discussions did so with the grace and professionalism the people sitting across the table from us should expect and deserve. And until this layoff, the idea of employee engagement driving economic value through workforce productivity had really only been apparent to me during times of growth. The hospital and the telecom company were already pretty great places to work. They were refining their visions, they were developing emerging talent. The real leaders emerge when they can drive engagement during the toughest of times. And our ability as leaders to express empathy and balance that with providing a compelling vision for the future during a layoff or a downturn will be carefully scrutinized. The impacted and the remaining employees are experiencing a wide range of emotions at different points along the grief cycle. Change is hard. Productivity declines. It's personal. And we experience it in our own unique ways and at our own pace. And when a workforce isn't productive, it isn't generating revenue. So how do you know? How do you know if you're engaged or you work in an engaging environment? Well, the Gallup organization has 12 employee survey questions that they initially published back in the 1990s. And I've watched these questions become refined over the years. Um, and some of those questions will include things like, do you know what's expected of you at work? Does your supervisor or someone at work seem to care about you as a person? Does the mission and, and purpose of your company make you feel like your job is important? And do you have a best friend at work? How many, by, how many people here have a best friend at work? It's a pretty great feeling to have a best friend at work and someone that you can lean on when you're having a bad day or uh, you're trying to articulate a particular message 
I leaned on a couple friends of mine as I was preparing for today. And uh, my work friends are, are really important to me. I've administered and analyzed results of a number of employee surveys over the years. And the questions we always focus our attention on are these that are related to engagement. When these scores are low, there's a correlation to high turnover, low productivity, and budgets and project deadlines are just simply not taken seriously. My career continued with the ebbs and flows of a typical HR business partner at the telecom company. And after a nearly five year run, I had the opportunity this time with a large global conglomerate to join their team. And that decision to leave was hard. I was a really engaged employee. I wasn't looking for a job. Someone had come to me and tapped me. Um, I had wonderful friends in this business. In fact, two of my dearest friends, uh, the two that I, that I talked to about this presentation today, uh, were part of that business. And we still get together all the time. And, and we've remained close, close professional colleagues and close personal friends over those years. And this global conglomerate was GE. GE was a company that I had also long admired. And when I was researching best practices for those programs that I was developing at the telecom company, GE's case studies were cited time and again. So the, the time came that I had to decide if I was going to advance my career in this new global environment or if I was going to stay where I felt comfortable. And I have to digress here and tell you just a little side story about my time at Culver Stockton because there's something that I did at Culver Stockton really influenced that decision. And when I was a student here, this was before experiential learning as it exists today. And at the time, we had something called American Freedom Studies. And we went through a, a, a period of, of time where once, uh, once each year, once each academic year, a trip would be organized. And so there'd be some sort of funding that would come together from the development office. <coughs> And then there would be faculty members who would put together ideas for, you know, here's a trip that we could take, a place that we could go, you know, Belize or Russia or wherever, and we will we'll go on this trip, we have enough funding to cover X number of students, we'll stay for this amount of time, we'll do these things. And so it was a competitive process for the faculty <coughs> at the time. So this particular year, 1994, uh, before most of you were even bored. Um, <laughs> uh, this particular year, we had a, a religion professor who uh, his trip was selected, and there was funding for five students to go on a trip, and I got to go to Bulgaria. And, uh, you know, Bulgaria was obviously a place I had never been, and uh, I, I grew up locally here. I, I grew up on a farm 15 miles down the road in Lewistown. And I'll tell you what my, my world view had been up until this time, because growing up in Lewis County uh, and then going to school here, I hadn't been very many places. And I was, I was trying to think, where, where had I been when I was preparing for this talk today? The farthest north that I had been was the Iowa-Minnesota border. And I don't even know what town it was, because it was a place that my dad went to buy a tractor once when I was a kid. So we had to drive up there so he could buy this tractor. And then the farthest west that I had been was Sedalia to the Missouri State Fair. And the farthest south I had been was Jefferson City to visit the state capitol. Uh, and I'd been there a few times. The farthest east I had been was Chicago because I took the, the Amtrak there with my parents in the sixth grade. And here I was in college and I hadn't been back. And of course, I've been to St. Louis many times and been to museums and the theater and all the things that we do in St. Louis. So I, I had a lot of exposure in, in St. Louis and baseball games and Six Flags and all of those, those fun things. And to be fair, we did have, you know, I grew up on this farm and my parents didn't really travel, so we didn't, we didn't go a lot of places. But I did get to Florida twice uh, for a very short time in high school. But, you know, I had a pretty limited worldview. And so to think that I was going to get on a plane and go halfway around the world was pretty incredible. And I had an amazing experience in Bulgaria. We were on this trip and we were 
uh, affiliated with um, the American University that was there, a, a woman who had been actually my academic advisor my freshman year, had taken uh, an assignment with this university and she eventually became the dean of the, of the school. And so part of this trip was actually to visit her and her husband and we stayed on campus and we did various things in Bulgaria. And Bulgaria had uh, a national holiday while we were there and so that meant that um, there was gonna be sort of this three day weekend where everything was gonna be shut down. So we had to go to Greece you know, in order to have something to do for those three days because everything was closed in Bulgaria. So, so you know, that wasn't a bad side trip while we were at it. And one of the really, the, one of the most interesting things that happened on that trip that has really stuck with me too is that we had a couple nursing students and they really wanted to see a hospital while we were there. So we had arranged to go visit a hospital in Bulgaria and I remember, you know, I didn't have the clinical perspective walking in, but I remember walking in the door and, you know, the floors were not shiny, the paint was chipping on the walls. We walked into a patient's room and we had this interpreter with us because the nurses wanted to, nursing students wanted to talk to the patient. And, uh, you know, windows open, there's a breeze blowing in. Can you imagine a hospital that you know, doesn't have filtered air today. And uh, so it was just such an interesting experience to, to see this. And I knew when I went on that trip that someday I'm gonna work for a global company and I'm gonna travel and do all these cool things and I'm gonna see the world from this new perspective that I was, you know, this new lens that I was looking through. So, you know, by this time, by the time I got this job at GE, I'd been out of school 10 years. And I, uh, I had applied for jobs at big global companies and you know, I didn't even get interviewed. And so to have the opportunity to go to GE was just like so exciting for me. And I, it wasn't even a global job when it started, but uh, within a year, I did move into a global job at GE. And I had, um, I had responsibilities not only in Madison, where we were living, but I had, uh, I was the HR leader for engineering sites that we had in Finland and in India and in China, and two newly acquired sites that we had in Israel and Sweden. And I brought with me, this is a passport that I had in college. This is my picture from college. And there are three stamps in this passport, Bulgaria, Greece, and uh, Prague the Czech Republic that we flew through on the way there. So then that passport was expired by the time I started at GE. Then I start at GE, I have to get a new passport. And in the 10 years that I had this passport, you can see I actually had to send it in to have pages added because I had so many stamps in this passport. I have stamps from 18 different countries I have work visas for Brazil, China, and India, sometimes multiples in those countries. Uh, I went to Cambodia once, had to get a visa to go there. So uh, I finally filled that passport, and it was just so exciting to get to do that. And then that passport expired, and now I have another one. So, uh, and I've got new countries on that one too. So I just, I wanted to share that story because there's so many experiences that you get to have when you come to a place like Culver and th that level of engagement that I had as a student and the things that just inspired me and excited me that I carried with me all these years after and then I finally got that job that was global. It was so exciting. So, you know, there were a lot of, of exciting times getting to travel the world. Um, you know, there were some, definitely some high highs, but there were some low lows. And I found myself making a lot of lists in this job, those lists that I was talking about previously. So as the business became more global, costs had to be contained. The future direction of the business meant that some work needed to be shifted to lower cost countries. And every few hires in a low cost country meant the loss of a job in Madison or Helsinki. So list after list after list. I was so good at making lists, my framework for managing a layoff was picked up by one of our attorneys and published in a global best practice toolkit for HR leaders across the company. 
I spent a lot of time reflecting on these lists. And if my husband were here, he could tell you all the very long nights, weekends, vacation days that I spent poring over lists of impacted roles, planning the communications for the business and the impacted employees, creating scripts for the managers, updating the Excel files with all the costing information and everything, preparing everything for the financial roll-ups. And the mechanics of how to conduct a layoff were actually the easy part. The most important time that I spent as I was preparing for these layoffs was reflecting on what I knew about the people being impacted. What was my relationship with these employees and how had I been engaging with them up to this point? How long had they worked in the business? What did I know about their families? How close were they to retirement? What could I recall from my recent conversations with them, which may formulate my thoughts on how they might respond to their layoff notification? It's incredibly important for an HR leader to have built a strong foundation with employees so that there's a level of trust from which to draw during the difficult times. And in the days that followed the layoffs, employees who were given notice would wind down their work and we'd have several face-to-face -face conversations. Some of those conversations were transactional. How do I continue my insurance? Where do I return my laptop? And some of those conversations were focused on potential career moves elsewhere in the company. Sometimes people would ask me to have a look at their resume or talk through how they were planning to approach their job search. And some were much more difficult. Stories of a special needs child who needed the financial support of this working parent, a spouse with a terminal diagnosis, tuition debt that would continue to mount, the retirement dream that would need to be pushed out, and sometimes someone just needed space to vent. The extra care spent with employees during these days not only impacted their own outlook and accelerated their time through the grief cycle, it also impacted their impression of the company as they were exiting. And every time they walked out my office door, they shared with their colleagues how they were being treated through the process. The employees who were not impacted by layoff were intently observing how their friends were being treated by me, by their managers, and by the company. It's incredibly personal. It's a different kind of engagement. When you've lost your job, it's not easy to come into work and be productive. Your coworkers don't know what to say to you, and you don't know what to say to them. And you may be very emotional and just trying to hold it together enough to get through the day. It's a lot to ask of someone who's been given notice to come in and finish a project or hand off their work to others. And it was my job to figure out how we were going to do it. I didn't have a playbook for this. I just simply had to figure it out. And I had to do the only thing I knew how to do, which was just be me. I've always had a reputation for being fair and firm and decisive. I was a trusted partner and I was known as an employee advocate and I had to trust my own instincts to express my empathy for the situation, but also move forward swiftly to enable the transition of the work. I also collaborated closely with the leadership team in the business during these times. We spent hours in conference rooms preparing for the layoffs, how they would be communicated, what vision we'd provide to the remaining employees about the future. Sometimes the outlook simply wasn't great. And that time that we spent as a leadership team preparing for the tough questions and formulating the messaging for how we're going to operate in the future allowed us to express the public messaging concisely, confidently, incredibly. In parallel with my HR business partner role in this global business, I was working on transactions with our mergers and acquisitions team. The business was a serial acquirer and needed focused attention on not just how to bring newly acquired employees on board, but also to integrate them into the GE culture. And I found this work absolutely fascinating. And after a number of years of working on deals as a side project, I was finally, <laughs> finally selected to be the first person to fill the full-time HR M&A leader role for all of GE Healthcare. This new direction with my career moved me from the more traditional HR business partner role and while it has been nearly seven years to the day that I managed my last big layoff in GE, since that time I've managed a number of GE transitions in a very different way. Working in mergers and acquisitions just sounds so exciting because it makes us think of acquiring something new, a shiny object with a lot of hope and uh, future growth of the business. 
but the reality is that the business that's being acquired by the buyer is also being divested by the seller, and that's not always a great story. I've run the HR work streams for at least 100 transactions with just as many businesses we've sold over the years as businesses we've bought. And the one common thread with these transactions, both on the buy side and the sell side, is that their success out the gate completely hinges on the engagement of the workforce. Productivity wanes as part of any time of change. Think of any time that you've been asked to change a process at work, learn a new playbook for your sports team, complete a workflow for the first time, write a paper on a topic that you were unfamiliar with. The changes on the surface that can appear to be seemingly simple are often the most difficult to overcome and create tremendous disruption. Our playbook, both as a buyer and a seller, has included a number of strategies to inform and engage the workforce throughout the journey. It's giving people information in pragmatic and digestible ways. Having the CEO get in front of the employees at town hall meetings and talk about what's happening with the deal, in a compliant way, of course. It's not over communicating. It's engaging in meaningful ways with a vision for the future and aligning individual performance objectives with the business strategy. In the M&A space, a lot of people think that granting retention bonuses is the best way to lock people into their roles during the integration. But what I've experienced through the years is that uh, while I would never personally turn down a retention uh, bonus, <laughs> uh, I love money as much as anyone, uh, I've seen them backfire many times. A manager who wants to solve a problem with money just simply doesn't want to solve a problem. I've witnessed business leaders on retention plans who've become absolutely toxic to their work environment once they decided that they were no longer wanting to be there, but had to hold out for another six or 12 or even longer months for a lucrative cash payment. If we can't give the person a compelling reason to come to work, there's no money that will solve that problem. So I'll share with you one final story about me. In 2016, I had a promotion opportunity to move to the GE digital business. And uh, it was experiencing, the, the digital business at the time was um, going through tremendous investment from uh, our corporate team. And it was about to go on an acquisition spree. It was the shiny object at GE and I wanted to be part of it. And about 18 months into the role, GE fell on really hard times once again. Our CEO of 17 years was suddenly ousted. Our stock price plummeted and funding for acquisitions came to an abrupt halt. And if you haven't followed the GE story, I encourage you to Google it. There's a great Wall Street Journal article from about a year and a half ago that talks about uh, that journey at the time. Some of the trustees like to remind me of where I work sometimes when, uh, <laughs> when we might be sharing a glass of wine in the evening. And, uh, and we talk about this article a lot. So after all of my years of making these lists that I've been talking about, I found myself on a list. I was facing my own layoff, and I had to come to terms with the reality of being on the list. I thought back to all those layoff conversations that I'd had over the years, and I drew inspiration from those whose seat that I now found myself in. And at the time I was losing my job, I was also dealing with the recent losses of both of my parents. So my father had died, and then 11 months later my mother died, and then 10 months after that I lost my job, and then six months after that my 21-year-old cat died. Uh, just like everything was going wrong at once. So you know, I was going through this job loss journey, and, uh, and I was in a real funk. I mean, I was a mess. And people who knew me at the time, you know, I had a couple friends, these trusted advisors that I was talking about earlier, who pulled me aside one day. And, and my friend Alice had said, you're a hot mess. You need to get yourself together. And so I decided that this layoff was going to be a time for me to embrace me. And um, so, you know, of course, getting laid off, one of the first things I do is spend money, and I uh, hire a nutrition coach, and I got my act together physically and mentally. And then, you know, I decide, well, you know, I kind of like having this time off. I feel really good. I've got all these lists, you know, at home now. I'm going to clean all these closets. I'm going to do all these great things. And uh, 
what I ended up doing was working out twice a day, going to yoga, going out for coffee with a friend, uh, going with friends to Nashville and Florida and different places. And I, I was having this really great time and not cleaning out those closets and doing those things that I should have been doing. And uh, about 60 days in, I got a call from GE and uh, they asked me to return. And my first answer to them was no. I'm having a great time. I'm on sabbatical, right? I'm working out twice a day. I'm traveling. I'm using all those airline miles that I had hoarded all those years. And the woman on the other end of the phone, uh, she persisted. She said, come back. It's just a six-month project. You'll start your severance over when it's finished. We'll, just, we'll, give it, we'll give it to you again. You can go on that sabbatical later. They needed me to come back and help them sell some of the remaining parts of the business some of which I had only recently helped to acquire, and all of which were crown jewels of the company and needed to be handled with care. And this was, a, again, kind of going back to that very trying time at GE. GE has um, $100 billion in unfunded pension debt that it needs to pay back for its employees, myself included. And uh, it has been forced to sell um, some of the best performing parts of the business in order to pay back that debt. And that has meant that the best revenue generating parts of, of our company have been for sale. And that also means that some of the best performing people in the company have been transitioned with that. So, you know, the, the woman who hired me back said this is gonna be a six month thing. It's been two years now. Uh, two years since I returned to GE. This last year, I've been more engaged than ever, and my latest project has been leading the HR work streams for a business that we're selling, 6,700 people in 41 countries, a price tag of $21.6 billion. We're probably going to close uh, in this quarter, finally. And, um, and the leadership team from that business has invited me to come across with the deal and help them run the integration with the buyer post-close. And I just have to tell you that this morning I had a conversation with my manager and I officially accepted the job. So you're the first to know. <laughs> so I'm so glad that I went back and that I could contribute this last little bit of work at GE. Uh, it helped me find the closure that I felt I was missing when I had to leave during my layoff two years ago. And I like to think that the work that I contributed to a good transition for the employees whose businesses were sold, you know, as I contributed to the salary and benefits protections that the buyers granted them as they moved across. Uh, and most of them are working for buyers who are recognizing the value of those businesses and they're investing in their growth. So I think a lot of those people are in a better place today than they would have been had they stayed in GE. So this is me. This has been my career path, and as I was preparing to talk to you today, I reflected on the events and the people who influenced my career the most, and the one thing that threaded my experience across the different industries and jobs was this idea that employee engagement was the catalyst for a productive workforce and ultimately a successful and, pro and profitable business. And while that idea of engagement can sound a little abstract or lofty, in practice, it's actually quite simple and straightforward. And you don't need to be in management to be engaging with your work team. The best leaders have demonstrated their ability to engage long before being in positions of authority. So as you return to your leadership roles with your campus teams and clubs and organizations, I encourage you to leverage some of the uh, ideas that came from the Gallup engagement drivers that I spoke about earlier and call your teams to action. Have you set actionable and achievable goals? And are those goals aligned with the mission or the charter of your team? Do you encourage and value participation in decision making and foster a safe and inclusive environment for sharing ideas? And have you had the opportunity to learn and grow in your leadership role? And have you fostered that same environment for others, especially making space for the likely successors in your to your leadership roles? 
Those of you in this room who are part of CSC Leads today have grown up during the digital age where we do a lot of texting instead of talking. The future workforce is to be going to become more fragmented, <coughs> complex, diverse, and our ability to express empathy and engage others at a personal level will define our success. Thank you for having me today. I feel so special.